arrogance makes you blind. I guess the ones closest to you. Chung from IGN and welcome to Spotlight, the first in the EA series that connects you to the games you love and the people who make them. Leading up to EA Play Live on July 22nd, EA invited me to come chat with the developers who are defining the future of first-person shooters. So please join me in welcoming Vince Sempella, founder of Respawn and Group General Manager, Chad Grenier, Game Director for Apex Legends, Christian Grass, General Manager of Ripple Effect Studios, and joining us live from DICE headquarters, Oscar Gabrielson, General Manager of DICE. Today we're going to talk about first-person shooters, especially Apex Legends and the recently announced Battlefield 2042. So let's jump in. This is an insane group. So doing some quick calculation, how many years of game dev experience do we have here? Got almost 20 years. For, for just spent you? all of it with Vince, actually, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh no. I'm sorry. Are, yeah. are those happy years? <laughs> it's been a roller coaster. <laughs> OK. And no, how about you? Uh, so I've been with DICE for 20 years as well, but with Vince only for two years. So uh, two good years though, really good years. <laughs> I like that you specify that they're two very good years. <laughs> um, Oscar, how about you? I'd say 24 years. Uh, you know, kicked off early with molding community back in the Counter-Strike and Quake days. Uh, since then came into DICE, you know, north of 10 years ago. Uh, so it's been a thrilling ride of many different shooters across the years. And this is the first time you guys were talking? I think we all individually talk all the time, but okay. just as one group, we haven't all been together oh. like this. So. so this is kind of, this is a very powerful group then. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's, it's like I'm a powerhouse of FPSs. <laughs> the Apex Games are where the champions are crowned, but the arenas are where legends are made. So Apex Legends took the world by storm, launching just over two years ago, and you had no advertisement before. So do you guys have any stories that you can share with us? Well, I recently just wrote a blog um, on our two-year anniversary, kind of talking about how we kept the game a secret and did the, the Beyonce drop um, at the time. Like, so we kind of we copied her strategy there. Always but, go with Beyonce. Yeah. yeah. And you win. Flawless. Exactly. You revealed Battlefield 2042 to the world last month. How does it feel to have the news finally out there? Uh, well, I, I think the theory is when you when you build a game and you're kind of looking forward to announcing it, you're supposed to feel excited and pumped and thrilled and all those kind of positive words. Yeah. The honest reality is pure agony uh, the last couple of weeks before you show off a thing. You know, you have teams that spend years and years and years, hundreds and hundreds of game creators creating these games, and then you get this final moment where you get to show the game to the world, and you never know what reactions are going to be. But of course, super happy to be able to show the game to the world. It's something we're super pumped about. Um, so tell us about the game and its trademark game events that are truly next level. You know, not many times in your career do you get the chance to go through a console transition. Uh, so when we got the chance now to work on a new generation of consoles, it really enabled us to rethink some of the kind of core building blocks of Battlefield, delivering a game at a scale we've never done before. And it comes both on the land masses you play Battlefield on, but also the player counts. You know, getting the chance to play with 128 players on an army scale kind of warfare setup. Uh, we added a lot of really cool gear to the game, things like grappling hooks, wingsuit. And then for some really cool reason, we elected to say, like, what about a real-time tornado? Real-time tornadoes are cool, right? What about adding one of those to Battlefield? And then what happens if you take that and you combine it with a wingsuit so you can kind of propel yourself to the other side of the map? You know, these tornadoes, they kind of help in kind of grand way when you play. Uh, there's been more than a few playtests in which you're in this really intense situation where you're honestly pretty screwed. And then a lovely tornado shows up and just sweeps all the enemies in front of you. You're like, hey! That worked. High five, Mr. Tornado. Uh, and I think those kind of really big Levolution moments that we're introducing as part of Battlefield 2042 is what makes the game special. You need to play on your toes every single second because you never know what Mother Nature throws at you. 
can you shoot like into and out of the tornado? Of course you can shoot at a tornado. Uh, and <laughs> <Okay>. that's uh, <laughs> one good way of understanding that the storm's actually approaching. It's just kind of looking up at the trees. If they're trying, you know, starting to bend a bit too much, you probably are supposed to start running because you're going to get, you know, sweeped up by that tornado sooner or later. Can you tell me how long the team has been working on the game? Yeah, so this is a three-year cycle for us, and that really has enabled us to both take a big leap when it comes to tech. So we're running on a completely new version of Frostbite, which has enabled us to push both visual fidelity and you know, core gameplay as a result. And really to kind of hone in on the concept, you've seen us talk about our notepad specialist, our new characters, and we've invested a lot of time and kind of love and passion into the storylines and the worlds and you know, the, the war we're portraying. Uh, so we're super happy to get the chance to do that. So DICE and DICE LA have had a long history with Battlefield, but before we talk about the history, DICE LA just rebranded. So can you tell us all about that, Christian? Uh, yeah, so the studio was formed eight years ago as a way of expanding the capabilities that, uh, that DICE had to build Battlefield. We wanted to push this idea uh, that we have in the studio where we really want to drive quality in everything we do uh, as a studio. And in order for us to do that in a really good way, we believe that you need to be good at listening. You need to listen to the people that work in the studio to kind of find these good ideas, these kind of nuggets of good ideas that we then try to turn into something real. Uh, and that sort of is ripple effect for us. It's this idea that great things have small beginnings, and that's kind of what a ripple effect is. But uh, we're super excited about the name. We feel like it represents us. It flows well. It's a good name. Uh, so the work that Oscar and Christian have been doing for Battlefield hasn't even been revealed yet, but Christian, I'm hoping that you can maybe give us a little bit of a hint. Uh, so I can't say that much uh, about <laughs> it. Uh, what I can say is this, though, is that one of the components in this experience that we're creating is that we're adding some of the fan favorite maps back into Battlefield 2042, but the entire experience, you have to wait a bit longer before we reveal what that is. The team at DICE announced Hazard Zone at the reveal, but didn't say much. We know it's being developed at DICE. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, so Battlefield 2042 ships with three core multiplayer experiences. We've shown off all of Warfare. Of course, Christian and his team have something special coming shortly that we'll show at EA Play Live. And our second experience is called Hazard Zone. It's a high stakes, squad based game mode uh, with a lot of high tension. It's not your classic Battle Royale, it's a really contemporary mode. Uh, it's also something the team has been thinking about for many years. I'm really looking forward to showing it to the world. It has some really special components and it really kind of leans into the superpowers of Battlefield and DICE at the same time. So we'll show more uh, later this fall, just a couple of weeks and months before we uh, launch the game in October. So Vince, you've been part of some of the biggest FPS games in the history of the genre, like Medal of Honor, Allied Assault, Call of Duty and Call of Duty Modern Warfare, also the sequels to both of those franchises, Titanfall 1 and 2, my personal favorites, and hey. Apex Legends, just to name a few. What is the secret ingredient to making a great FPS? A great team. <laughs> that was immediate, I love that. Yeah. I think it goes back to something Christian uh, mentioned, which is finding nuggets of, of gold within the team members themselves and, and um, putting them into the game, right? Building a great team where people are, uh, you know, have this initiative and they're passionate about making games. Ideas come from anyone. And so if you put the right people in place, then those ideas just sort of happen, it's assuming you have a collaborative culture and a place where people feel like they can speak up and pitch ideas. And, and not all ideas are good. Like you have to be, <laughs> like we'll throw out ideas and you know, I'll say something and Chad will say, that's stupid, we're not doing that. Like, okay, and he's probably right most of the time. What was an idea in Apex that you guys threw out? Besides oh. Titan, because we all know everyone's been asking about Titans. There's a lot. Coming off of Titanfall 2, we had a lot of the Titanfall 2 mechanics in the game, like the Titans, and that was something that we, we decided to cut, as well as uh, wall running and the jump packs. And I know those are all favorites of Titanfall players, but they added to what we call Brownian motion in our game, where players can sort of be anywhere at any time, and we wanted a slower paced, more predictable combat where you know, you can predict when someone goes around the corner, like, you know, the possibilities of where they could be and not, and not that they can be anywhere. Um, and then the Titans just sort of, you know, were a weird balance. They were sort of, how do you make them powerful enough that you feel really cool when you're in a Titan, but not OP? We had drop pods at the beginning instead of jumping out of the plane and sort of doing the, the skydive. 
we had a, a map that you would pick where you would drop and sort of just instantly dart down in a drop pod. But you know, we found during playtest that giving players more time to reposition and see where other players are going and rethink strategy was more fun. Going to check it out over there. It's a lot of playtesting and you know trying things and failing fast and moving on or improving if you see a promise in it. So, yeah, I, I think it's incredible to see like your team work together. And like you said, a great team makes a great FPS because now you have this title that is esports ready. And you know, ALGS has been doing wonders. A lot of people have been wanting to enter into it, and so. It's just kind of the proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah, we're really glad that people are playing it competitively. And ALGS has been great, just held the championships. So that was really cool, um, really big prize pool. So that's been exciting. Looking forward to doing it again next year. I know you mentioned your team with Ripple Effect now. So would that kind of be your same answer? Yeah, of course, Key is a great team. I mean, that's how you succeed. The other thing that I really like is, uh, and I think that's something that the Battlefield franchise has done well, is not being afraid of, of taking risks and not saying no instantly. So if someone comes up with an idea, like having a tornado real time <laughs> in the game, someone doesn't just say, that's insane, cut. Instead, it's like, yeah, maybe that could work. And that kind of what if question, I think is super important. So you take some risk, like we introduced uh, destruction back in Battlefield by Company 1 into the game, which wasn't necessarily from a development point of view a sane idea, but it was a cool idea and we wanted it, so we kind of pushed for it, even though uh, it, it was really difficult to do. But then, like, uh, like Vin said, you have to balance that with uh, being bold enough to cut things that don't work uh, as well. And that is actually more difficult than it sounds. It's difficult to cut things that you've been working on for a long time. So I think that balance is really important to strike. Uh, then turning to Oscar, is there anything that you've had to cut from previous games that you've worked on that kind of made you feel a little bit sad? Oof. I have one that I miss you know, every single day. We'll hopefully get it back in you know, some Battlefield version. It's actually something we did back in the Battlefield 4 days called Tablet Commander. Uh, so you might remember, you could actually join into a 64-player Battlefield session on your tablet, either an Android one or an iOS one. And we even had voice over IP support. So you could kind of call in supplies, you know, do a bunch of things from the iPad. And the reason I remember it so well, it was actually the same year I got my first kid. So I couldn't sit in front of a console or a PC, but what I could do is I could carry my kid on one arm and I could have my iPad on the other one and I could scream at my squad and give them squad <laughs> orders. So we just need to get Tablet Commander back and us not having it in the next couple of games is still really frustrating me. So we, we have to fix that. Do you think we can make that happen? Uh, hopefully at some point it will be back in the game. I don't know though. Uh, let's do a classic, Christian. You, you and I this weekend, Oscar, let's write some code. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How hard can it be? <laughs> yeah, I, I love the Commander feature as well. That's a good call out, Oscar. So going back to Apex, Chad and Vince, you guys have been able to knock it out of the park with every season launch. And I think season nine was one of the best because you also brought back Titanfall 2's most infamous pilot, Viper, with Valkyrie and created this new backstory for a character that we really didn't get that much screen time with. How do you guys keep doing it? Well, our writing team is, just loves Titanfall and they're trying you know, every moment to try to squeeze something in. We've seen that the fans really love it too. And so when there's an opportunity, we, we obviously want to do it. The team is just generally very familiar with all of the characters and the universe and, and all the lore. So sometimes it's a natural fit and sometimes we just, you know, we'll pull in a Ash to, to run the, the arenas or something like that, you know. It's all in the same universe, so it happens fairly naturally. I think I saw that you guys even pulled in a community member to the writing team, right? I think that's incredible. What was your decision-making process on that? Yeah, as the game gets bigger and we've got you know more devs working on the game, we needed to really document and start cataloging you know our lore and what we've done, what we haven't done, and who's who. And so he had already been essentially doing that <laughs> for free. And so we just reached out and asked if he wanted to work for us. And uh, yeah, now he works at Respawn and he's sort of our lore expert now. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, the universe is something that we're building on and we have big plans for in the future. So it's really important that we keep, keep <laughs> our keep heads straight on everything. Because <laughs> it's not always easy. Yeah, and I, I noticed that you also brought in, um, I think, community artists for all the Apex panels and even on Twitter, not even just in game. So how do you find these people, these artists, and who, how do you pick them? Man, they, there's been so much good art. We don't ask for it. They just, they just post it. And it's amazing. Thank you all. It blows our minds. So we've done a bunch of things with the community. And, and honestly, we're just getting started. We're, we're going to you know, hopefully do a lot more. We've um, reached out to a few people, and they've done some comics for some of our seasons. Um, we just partnered with someone in the community to do an animated uh, Pathfinder video. 
Game over. Thanks for playing. And yeah, just getting started. The, there's so many amazing artists out there, and you know we're we're also hiring, so they can always oh. can always apply. Also, <laughs> but they're doing great work. That's amazing. I, nice I think job it's so getting cool. that in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's amazing that you've been able to tie the community into this and kind of give back in that sort of form. I, I love it so much. Even the casual comics that I see retweeted on the Apex Legends Twitter account. I think it's really cool that you've been able to bridge that gap between people who are so passionate and aren't necessarily developers or in the gaming industry, but they just want to share their love of the game. And you guys have like embraced the community, which is incredible. Yeah, and we've been partnering with them to actually help get them actual lore so they can release their own comics and things that are that are actually, you know, like a legit backstory and it's not just their own creation, but. Yeah, yeah. I think that's awesome. Some legends fight for fortune, others answers. But we shall all be forged in the glorious realm. Mirage, quiet. What was the inspiration for Apex Legends? Well, we were really passionate about making a team-based game. And we initially were prototyping with different classes and how do you create team play? And so some of our early legends were like Lifeline, you know, being the combat medic. Pathfinder um, came over from Titanfall 2 and sort of naturally found some abilities. That was fun. But I think once we honed in on making the game about the actual legends, not so much the abilities or the, or the gameplay, but more through the eyes of these legends, that's when the game really took off from a development point of view. And, and a lot of the team just got really passionate about the actual legends themselves and who they are. And then things start lining up and making sense, like why is Bloodhound doing these abilities? And I think that's when the team sort of became aligned and started working together. We talk of victory and slaughter. Yeah, and I think we were looking at what was happening kind of as we progressed after Titanfall 2, like what, where we would take multiplayer and kind of looking at, you know, the Battle Royale space and it kind of blowing up and we wanted to take that and do something new and unique with it. So kind of combining that, you know, the character based play with that just made sense. Yeah, and I think you guys said that you want to expand beyond Battle Royale, which was evident in Season 9's arenas. Can you guys give us a hint at what else you might be planning going beyond Battle Royale? Yeah, so Battle Royale will continue to be a, a primary focus for us. Um, that's, you know, the, that's the roots of the game. But we have been trying to expand beyond Battle Royale because we have you know, what we think is a really great combat loop and a fun core gameplay. Um, and so we're trying to offer more ways to play. So we just released arenas in Season 9. And in season 10, I can confirm that we'll be releasing a ranked version of Arenas. The rules are simple. Whoever survives, wins. So I'm very curious, what FPS defined you as a developer? Uh, so for me, it's the first FPS game uh, I shipped, which was Battlefield 1942. It took off, became a huge success. So kind of everything there on that journey, building that game and experiencing the launch. I mean, it's one of the greatest, I guess, memories I have in, in my career. So that's that's the game that defined me. I just realized you launched with 1942 and now it's 2042. How do you feel about that? I feel really good about it. So when uh, I, I love the, the name, um, so I think that was a great uh, choice uh, going back to, to, to our roots in a way. So I really, I, I love that name and I love it sort of coming together. Uh, what about you, Oscar? Yeah, I have to go back to my classic Counter-Strike days. I know I spent decades and decades, it feels like, in the game. I still, like, on a rainy Sunday, um, instead of actually playing, like, proper multiplayer games, I will just join an empty Dust2 server and I will work on my smoke grenades just to make sure. I don't know why. Uh, I haven't given up, in that, you know, given up on that dream of becoming a pro player. It'll never happen, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's still my go-to game on a, on a rainy Sunday. And uh, what about Vince? I'm very curious. Um, probably like Doom, because the modding, you know, we spent a lot of time like making mods and trolling our friends as we played, you know, kind of land party style. Um, and then playing probably Quake 3 Arena was probably like the game that I had the most fun, you know, playing competitively. Do you think you could have gone pro in it? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, how about you? Yeah, I'm kind of surrounded by my idols here because I grew up, as far as multiplayer gaming, um, playing a lot of Battlefield 1942. And then um, what got me my start in my career is actually playing and modding uh, Medal of Honor Allied Assault, which is a game Vince uh, made. So, um, and then, you know, that's how I met Vince and got my job and all that and started working on Call of Duty. How does it feel, like, hearing all this right now? Uh, it feels really good, of course. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's like we're all fans of each other's work. I mean, I love playing Allied Assault. Modern Warfare was amazing. Uh, I, I used to play a ton of um, Counter-Strike as well. I think maybe... Most of us did. That was that was a ton of fun. 
So when are you and Oscar going to team up for CSGO? That's a good question. I'm pretty sure Oscar is way better than, than I am. So <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe or maybe you. you can carry me, Oscar. Yeah. I, I think the five of us you know, on this call, we're all great in theory, at least. And that's a really good start. <laughs> uh, the question is if we can translate to in a good place. But maybe, maybe we can schedule something for this weekend. We just need to finish these games we're working on. I'm... Yeah, I think people assume that we're good at the games we work oh, on. No, no, it's, no, no. Like, it's this weird thing where you, you put out a game and instantly you have like an hour window, maybe, where you, yeah. you know, you know the tricks better than the players, and then they just surpass you like that now. It's, it's crazy. Actually, I'm really curious. How many times, like, what, what is a moment where you've seen a fan post gameplay of something that you never thought was possible in a game? Every day. Every day? Is there, like, a favorite moment? What was the curved bullet thing in Titanfall? <sighs> curved bullets? I don't remember that one. Yeah, where they used the warp thing, and they would curve bullets and hit people. Oh, what? Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad I wasn't playing against them. <laughs> yeah, anytime we release something new, also, we think it's like really well balanced, and then we release <laughs> it, and we just like, oh no, people are doing that with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's awesome. Love it. Okay, what about a battlefield moment? Because I know that can get, I mean, you're adding a tornado now, so what is, what is one of the wildest battlefield moments that you've ever had? Uh, I remember actually, which was kind of bizarre, we were playing against a bunch of journalists on BF 1942 early on, and they took the B-17, and started wing walking on the B-17. So the entire team flew on the B-17, walking <laughs> on the wings. That was an amazing moment that like, yeah. We, yeah, we didn't even know that you could do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the kind of magic pieces when it comes to Battlefield is this notion of like what people can do in, in a social construct. And, and I mean, and many actually of the Easter eggs we produce across the years in Battlefield really are all about players coming together and doing things together to unlock something unexpected or crazy. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, so there's some magic sauce there in Battlefield that really works well with the community. So earlier this year, EA moved Need for Speed to go all in on Battlefield. Can you tell us how that works with a total of three studios and EA Gothenburg supporting specifically on Frostbite engine tech? Yeah, I mean, I'd say on a normal year, it would be borderline impossible to pull in that many studios to build a game like this. But I think this COVID environment we've been in means that it's actually easier to scale teams because we're all in the same kind of infrastructure, Zoom meetings, virtual whiteboards, virtual playtests, you know, everything has the word virtual ahead of it. So this is by far the biggest Battlefield team, you know, we've ever had. And that's really enables us now to ship these like, three core, you know, uh, multiplayer experiences as part of the Battlefield 2042 launch. Uh, but it's been a grand adventure, a uh, couple of months left, uh, you know, and just kudos to everyone in Gothenburg, Guildford, LA, and of course the team back in Stockholm, you know, everyone's come together. And it's honestly not only those folks, there's been engineers and artists and audio designers from kind of every single corner of the world across Electronic Arts helping out on this game. And I think you've, you've seen it when you, uh, you, you've seen the reveal trailer and the gameplay assets, it's really shining through. So, you know, kudos and thanks for all the help. are about to get mighty interesting. So Chad, we're coming up on the next season of Apex already. What are some lessons you've learned from the past year? Yeah, there's been a lot of lessons. I think from a, from a development perspective, you know, make sure that we're, we're giving everything enough time to, to be good before it comes out. I mentioned earlier ranked arenas coming next season. That's one of those things that just wasn't quite ready. And so we just push it a season. I think early on, we were probably trying to hold our, to our guns and release things on schedule. And now I think we just we're a little bit more flexible with that sort of thing. And I think the players have responded well to that. Um, you know, we'd re much rather release something when it's really good and ready than to just get it done on time. Yeah, I don't think everyone realizes how much time some of this takes. Like, characters are, we've gotten it down now to only about a year. Yeah, it's a little bit more. Yeah, a year and a half <laughs> or so. So, like, we spend a lot of time kind of honing them so it sucks to rush it out at the end, you know, with things. We want to be able to have the time to, to make it perfect or as perfect as we can. I, out of curiosity, how, how long would a map take to develop? We're generally about a year and a half from when we first start doing blockouts to, to shipping. What about map changes, actually? Is that any easier than doing full map updates? It's definitely a lot easier. Um, like a map update is generally about six months, 
So we're a couple seasons ahead on those. And then a town takeover, we're usually about one season ahead. So. And actually, I'm very curious, how long does it take to make a map in Battlefield? Mm, somewhere between six and 12 months, based on size, complexity, is it a new biome, new gameplay opportunities. It's a bunch of time uh, to pull that off, especially our big player counts. It's just a massive challenge, really balancing everything there. So then that kind of begs the question, how hard is it to run a live service game? <laughs> a lot harder with... than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> We're still learning how to do it, I think. You know, it's kind of, we get better every time, I hope. And uh, I think there's a lot of content, a lot, you know, it's a lot of testing. You know, the good part of it is you can put things out there and try things and not being afraid of things failing, you know, but that puts a lot more onus on the team to create content to that the fans, you know, like they need to last an entire three month season and have enough content to keep people coming back and engaged and entertained. You'll see. <laughs> yeah, we look forward is, to it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, is there any advice that you'd want to give Christian and his team? I'll let Chad answer this one. I, you know, if I could go back, I think the only advice I'd give myself was to make sure that you've got the, the pipeline and the tools and the, and the team ready to start creating that content. Because for us, we were all in on launch. We launched the game and then it's like, oh, this game got popular. We have to do like a season. Season one, what are we going to put in it? And we had very little content ready to go. Yeah, the first couple of seasons were yeah. a lot of work for the team. Yeah. We've slowed it down now and kind of balanced, you know, we want quality of life for the team too. So we kind of always try to ride that line, but the first couple were. We were rough. also just very used to two year long or more life, uh, development time and then a big release. And it was the same for the release of Apex. So we had never done, how do you ship something in? in a month or in three months even. And so we just had to completely change the way that we think about development. So Oscar, I'm curious, after hearing all of these stories, how are you guys preparing for Battlefield 2042's live service? You know, of course, we've had the Battlefield 4 live service we did together with Christian and the team over in Dice LA. We had, you know, Battlefield 5 just recently. We took Star Wars Battlefront 2 on quite a journey, adding new content and updates, evolving that game a whole lot after launch. Uh, so we have a couple of tricks up our sleeve as we get to the live service for Battlefield 2042. And many of those learnings actually came from Apex Legends and all the great work the Respawn team has done with that game. Yeah, I mean, with this job, you kind of get to learn new things every day. We constantly grow and change and push the boundaries. So it's one of the most exciting things about doing this. Yeah. You also feel like when you release a game that you worked on for that long and you're done, Every, you know, my experience, the team kind of feels like they wish they could have done this or that. Yeah. It's never quite done, right? It's sort of the artist mentality. So the nice thing with live service, it's like, well, it's not done. You can keep doing, you can keep changing, you can keep polishing or doing whatever you want. So there's a benefit. And you also get that instant kind of gratification. So normally we, we spend two to three years before anyone sees what we're doing. Uh, whereas in a live service world, we can create something today and then a few weeks later, it's in the hands of players. When we were doing the community test environment for BF4, that loop was even shorter. We did something on Monday and it was in the hands of players on Tuesday because it didn't have to be perfect. It was a test environment. And our developers love that, that instant feedback that you get from something and kind of working that closely with the community. It's very different from the quiet and secret, uh, secretive for two years and then we launch it. Uh, <laughs> Seems like you guys have a lot of fun with it, which is really great. This is my favorite part. Exciting. It's time we jump to the part that everyone has been waiting for. What does the future of FPS games look like to you? Vince, because you have the most history with FPS games, we'll start with you. What does the future look like? Apex versus Battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Deathmatch. <laughs> We're going to bring it on. Um, I don't know. I think the, you know, the best part is we don't really know yet. There's so many things that we haven't even thought about or put thought into yet that, that it's exciting. And we get new consoles now, so we see the, you know, the power that we haven't even really started to unlock yet, so that'll get better and better. Yeah, how about you, Chad? Um, the other thing that excites me is there's a whole new generation of gamers, and we're up here talking about, you know, games we've played in the past, and there's people who have never even heard of them or never had the chance to experience them. So I think there's a lot of gameplay experiences that you can pay homage to or something, or, or experiences you can, you can bring, right? Um, Respawn just, just made a World War II game, for instance, and I grew up on a World War II game that Vince made, ironically. Um, and I think a lot of people experienced it for the first time and learned something about World War II. And um, so just opportunities like that. There's a whole new generation of gamers, and so that's exciting. Christian? It feels like there's so much more we could do and, and should do on the kind of social side of our games. 
if you look at a traditional sport, you could kind of, I don't know, you could go outside and just kick a ball or throw a ball and you can watch it on TV and you can go to a stadium and watch it and you can uh, participate in fantasy versions of it. And it's like it becomes more than just that actual game, which I feel like we're only at the beginning of that where we can turn it into more of a social thing where you, you know, you hang out in this world, in these worlds that we create, not just to compete, but also just to be there with your, your, your friends. I think there's a ton of, ton of exciting potential there. Oscar, I'm very curious as to what your answer is. You know, cloud computing has really changed a bunch of other industries and, and gaming kind of barely touched on it. So if you think about a game like Battlefield, we have things like AI in the game now, destruction, actually procedural level creation. And the next gen consoles there are, of course, super powerful. Uh, but if we move mu much of that logic out to the cloud, which is kind of servers and other language, uh, we can do some really high scale computing that we haven't been able to do in the past. Destruction, visual fidelity. Uh, and I think it's just a couple of years away, and then you'll see some pretty cool shooter games out there, I'd imagine. But we'll see. Soon, trademark. Battlefield 2042 being one of them? Uh, no comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chad, what should we expect from EA Play Live on July 22nd? Yeah, so our next season is rapidly approaching. So we're going to be unveiling some new information around our upcoming season, including uh, some information about our next legend. He is very interesting and unique in many ways, and I think players will be really excited to learn about him. I'm very excited to learn, and I'm, I'm assuming you can't share more about that, but I'm so excited. So, Oscar, what should fans expect from Battlefield 2042 at EA Play Live on July 22nd? So I think it's that mode that was on the whiteboard for many decades and many years and never kind of happened, and now Christian and his team in LA have been you know, orchestrating and building it. So, Christian? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's super exciting and, of course, a bit nerve-wracking, kind of showing something uh, for the first time, but uh, hoping that the, the players, the community, will, uh, will really embrace and like what we're going to show them on uh, July 22nd. Yeah. I think they will, Christian. It's cool. It's really exciting. It's cool. Yeah. It's really yeah. cool. It is the a... passion from the team comes through, you know, every time they show it off. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, Christian and his team actually showed Lars Mr. Battlefield Gustafsson uh, that experience just a few weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, Lars, as you might know, has been with the franchise for the two decades that existed. I think he was jumping around on the Zoom chair, really, really happy with what we saw. <laughs> and I think that's a great testament to what to expect in, at the EA Play Live. So get a sturdy chair ready to watch it. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. It was so great to hear everyone's experiences and I'll let you guys get back to your game development. I'm so excited to see what you guys have in store for us. So thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this first Spotlight. More from the EA Play Live Spotlight series coming soon. Follow at EA on Twitter or go to EA.com for the latest updates. Also remember, EA Play Live is July 22nd and you don't want to miss that. I'm Stella Chung from IGN, and this was a ton of fun. Thanks everyone for joining, and I'll see you on the battlefield.